Welcome to the Pultcast. I'm Courtney Stack. And I'm Lisa Turner. And I'm pretty excited about our conversation today, Courtney. And we're talking to Michelle Harlow, one of our PMs at Polk, and she's probably well known for getting the job done, don't you think? Definitely, definitely. And you know, it's exciting because we're also interviewing one of our female leaders during Women in Construction Month. Yes, definitely. Closing the month out on a high. So let's go ahead and get our conversation started. Hi, Michelle. Oh. How are you? Peachy. Good. Excited you're here today. Thanks for having me. This is, I hope this is going to be fun. This will be super fun. Yeah. fun. Super fun. Well, just to get us going, can you kind of talk about your path to Polk? Because you kind of have an interesting way into your current role as a project manager. So I actually worked for one of our customers, for one of Polk's customers, for 16 years. So when I was let go from that position, then immediately I already knew a lot of the guys here. And so that same week, I had, I had an interview with Polk and hired on as a APM, and I've been here now oh, going on 11 years. Yeah. So did you always know that you wanted to be in construction? Or did you just kind of find yourself in it? Oh, I definitely found myself in it, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, at the time that I was there, uh, early on, I was actually going to school for nursing and eventually became a paramedic. And so I, I figured, you know, I was going to go the medical route and ended up loving processes and machinery and all of that. And it just kind of, it's where I stayed. <laughs> That's interesting. I love to hear what draws somebody to it, especially if that wasn't like your original intended path. Mm -hmm. I, I love, and the, the difference, you know, here I'm, I'm on the commercial side, but the industrial side, I think has always been kind of my background. It's, there's such a difference and a contrast between industrial and commercial because industrial, there is, usually there's no budget. I mean, not that there isn't a budget. There is a budget, but it's do whatever you have to do to get them running again because every minute, every hour that they are not running, that that plant is down, they are losing tons and tons of money. So you just throw everything you have at it and you go. And it's very high stress, very fast pace, fun. I, I love, I can't describe it. It is fun. Commercial, different level of stress, but it's more spread out. <laughs> so it's super stressful. Every day you've got a, a cap on your budget. You've got a cap on your schedule. And so you have to manage your time within that. Mm. So there's there's pros and cons to both sides. And I truly like both sides of it. Mm. If, if they ask me today, do you want to do industrial or commercial? I truly couldn't tell you which one. True. Mm. You like them both. So what, is, what do you think the biggest challenge as a project manager is? Is it working with the field? Is it working with customers? Is it managing your cost? Or is it a combination of all those? It's definitely, it's definitely all of it. You have to keep up with your customers. You have to meet their needs. But my guys are my customers too. And so, and there's different personalities different challenges to all of that uh, you may not always get along with the project team from on the gc side but you have to build those relationships because things do get so stressful and so if you don't have that underlying relationship there when things get hard or you've got to have those hard conversations it's 10 times worse if, if you haven't already built a foundation with them and it's the same with the guys i I truly enjoy working with the guys. We have a good time on site because that's important. Just when dippers are high or stress is high and you're trying to get done or whatever, just to take time out and just do a family lunch where everybody is on the same side. Mm -hmm. That's important to me. And then building relationships with with the AT APMs has always been, that's always been really important to me was to be a kind of mentor to because I know what it's like to be an APM. I know what it's like to come in brand new and to try to find your place and find your way. And it's overwhelming at first because there's so many things being thrown at you all at once and you're just supposed to pick up and run with it. And it's not that easy. It's definitely not that easy. So I, I enjoy teaching and I enjoy training. Do you feel like because you build those relationships 
um, early on when you come across a challenge, does it make it easier to go and like explain the situation or definitely? I mean, the, the, the biggest thing for me is to own it. If we've done something wrong, if it means a delay, if it means additional cost, whatever it means, be honest and own it. Because I, all the guys that work with me know I don't like surprises. If you try to fix something and hide it from me and I'll find out later, then it just, it makes all of us look bad. So if we've made a mistake, if we've done something wrong, if I've done something wrong, own it and say, this is, this is what's happened. This is how we're going to correct it. And, you know, always have that path forward. Like, do you have champions, so to speak, on your team that, like, if you are tied up with something else, you have people that you can go to that have also built those relationships where you can say, hey, I'm really tied up on this. You know, sometimes probably two emergencies happen at once, right? And like, hey, I'm going to handle this. Can you take that over? Or how do you usually manage that? I have a few jobs that are at a critical point right now. And so, of course, every project thinks that you're priority should be that project and it should be as you know when you're there that is your priority but but then there's outside forces that that pull you in different directions so even though i'm i might be at one project i'm still getting phone calls all day long regarding the other projects so it's important to me especially when i'm on site with those guys and i get those phone calls hey you know i'll send a text message immediately i'm in a meeting i'll text you back i'll meet back on a break or whatever so that they don't feel like, or that customer, whatever, doesn't feel like I'm ignoring them because I'm not on site at their project. And you just have to work it that way. It doesn't, everything doesn't happen between eight and five every day. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it rarely ever happens. I've never had an emergency that happened at <laughs> eight o'clock in the morning. We had it cleaned up by five o'clock that afternoon. It's just not the nature of our jobs. So I try to lean in those situations, the the project superintendent that's on site, and I, I have a really good group of of superintendents, and my my general superintendents are good too. So I'll call, you know, my general superintendent. Hey, this just came down. I'm going to need your help on this, and you know, and they're they're the same. They're going from job to job to job to job. So that's that's important to have that relationship as well because they know. If I'm calling for their help, then it's more than I can handle just by myself. Sounds like there's a lot of trust. There is. It's. I mean, we've we've been doing it together for several years, and he has his lane, I have mine, and and we constantly talk about. Well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? But but everybody on those teams are are in on it uh, all the way from the APM on that team to the general superintendent. When it's cohesive like that, I think that's when it's really cool. On that note, like the cohesiveness of it, there is a lot of overlap, right? I mean, it's like when you're in the reverse of the bell curve, they're at the height of the bell curve. There has to be a lot of communication. What is important for APMs and superintendents to talk about? Or I think they need to be constantly talking to each other, for sure. Um, APMs coming in now are coming from usually the construction management programs or, you know, at either A&M or Texas Tech, but not a whole lot of field experience. And so as they're learning the management side of it, they also need to be learning the systems that go along with it. And to actually know when a superintendent is asking for something or needing something, you got to know what he's asking for, or asking for, it. and what the priority on that is. So there's there's a lot of shotgun blasts, you know, where things just get thrown at you, and you have to prioritize those items as you're learning. And a lot of that comes from from the PM you're you're with as an APM. I had I was extremely extremely fortunate to have the mentors I had. And I, and I learned something from, at one point, I worked for nine project managers. And all nine of them were different, but I took something from each of them. From the APMs that you have mentored, mm-hmm. and the you know, people that you worked with, what would you say 
if you could think of like one thing that, oh, you know, a successful APM has this or does this, could you think of one thing that sets apart the really successful ones from the ones who maybe aren't hitting the mark? The ones that are always asking questions, always cut. Don't do it because you were asked to do it. Ask why, why is this, where is this in our process? What is this for? How is this relate to this, you know, me? And then once you're finished with a task, okay, I'm done with that. What's next? What else can I do? Mm -hmm. That's that's important. And then once you do learn those processes, going ahead and picking up the, the ball and running with it on the next project. Hey, you know, I learned how to do submittals on the last one. I'm going to go ahead and get these, make a list of the submittals that I know I'm going to need on this one and get started on that without being told to. And that, that just takes time and experience. From learning like the field perspective side of it, um, do you encourage your APMs to like sit with superintendents or go spend time with them? Or what's the process look like for that for to make somebody successful on that side of it to help learn? The field? Nowadays, um, so there's two sides of that. I, I do think it's important for them to spend some time in the field with the superintendent. They need to get to know them and the superintendent needs to be able to trust them as well. Not all, I mean, we're sharing office trailers with them. We're, you know, sharing lunches with them. So they need to be able to trust them as well. And like I said, I want the APMs to know the systems that we're installing. And when a, a superintendent turns in his materials list, do you know what those items are on that material list? And so that helps from that aspect. But then when the invoices come in, you get invoices for this material. Do you know what that material is? that's listed on there do you know because you need to know what it is to know how to code it on the the invoicing system so of course all that's changing with the new year p but for right now theoretically they'll still have to know what it is even in the new system right but they should yes but i mean you have to know if it's cast iron or if it's copper or if it's you know a hangers material any of that so you need to know what that material looks like both in the field and on paper when you place the orders and when you get the invoices for them. <laughs> Do you think that your organization at work is the same at home? Like, are you no, on level? Oh, no, that's interesting. I, well, if you ask my husband and, and daughters, they, they would definitely say that my daughters tried to tell me you're a project manager at work. You don't have to manage us. So <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that's just my personality. I want things to... My husband's an engineer mm -hmm. and... Sometimes our two styles don't work together when we're building fences on the property or whatever. <laughs> so it's, uh, I have to learn my role at home all over again when I get home because I, I get so into it at work. Then it, it's hard to, business, but it's hard to turn that off when I get home. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuffs. How many daughters do you have? Three. 27, 25, and 21. One of them does live with us. Uh, she works full time, but she basically stays at the house, sleeps there. Um, our, that's our middle daughter. And our youngest daughter is a senior at a college we shall not name. Right. And if you know Michelle, you know the rival yeah. strong alliances. So, <laughs> who you fan Michelle and does not like the other unnamed school in Austin? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm very, very proud of her. Oh, yeah. If that's what makes her happy, fine. But, Homer Singer. Anyway, um, and then our oldest daughter, uh, her and her husband are stationed in Maryland. He's their force. Tom, would you say any of them have that that organization that you have or? Or very structured or process oriented like you? No. No. It's always funny to see like what yeah. kids get from which parents. They little pieces of it, I think they do, but I think they've learned from seeing me what how they don't want to be. <laughs> oh good. <laughs> well, this is actually a good segue talking about daughters. You know, it is Women in Construction Month. I've heard you say a few times, my guys, you know, <laughs> so it's no secret that, right, this is a, a male-dominated field. So do you want, Do you have any experiences or tidbits of information you can share about being a woman in the construction industry? I think the biggest thing for me is 
I respect them the way I want them to respect me. So if, if I went in with a I am woman, hear me roar attitude, <laughs> then they're they're not going to, they're going to flick me off like a bee. But if... Flick me off like a bee. I know exactly. I've never heard that. Though. That's good. But anyway, flick me off like a bee. <laughs> but buzzing in there. Yeah. It's just, I, I try, and there's boundaries. You know, I mean, I, I don't... I don't talk to the guys like they talk to each other. I don't go in there and try to be one of the guys because I'm not. And uh, that's that's not what I'm here to do. I'm not here to be their best friend. I'm not here to be, I'm not even here to be their boss. I'm here to be their partner. And and that's how we get the job done. They have They have their jobs to do that they can't do without me. And I have my job to do that I can't do without them. And so it's not a, it's not a who's better or who's smarter or any of that. We have to have each other to get our jobs done. And I respect the hell out of them and mutual respect. It has to be yeah. that way. It's not going to work any other way. Mm-hmm. I treat them the way I want to be treated. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. Before you leave, we do have a fun question for you. Okay, Michelle. Spirit animal? Oh, <laughs> do you have a spirit animal? I don't know. Maybe a Highland cow. I don't know. Highland cow, great. Or the furry one, right? Yeah. Funny accent, a lot of hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. That's perfect. That's Michelle, funny accent, a lot of hair. <laughs> oh my gosh. The one we've done before is, and bear with me on this question, if the world was ending and we were kind of going into a post-apocalyptic scenario, who would you want with you to take on the zombies? It could be personal people. It could be work people. Whoever you think would be good to hang around with and maybe good for survival as well. Dave Grohl. Dave Grohl. I knew that was going to be your answer. Yeah. Why well, answer to everything is Dave Grohl. The dude from the Foo Fighters. The dude from the Foo Fighters? Is he not the Foo Fighters? He is, but he's so much more. Oh, I thought I didn't. What you want than indeed? I thought I got him wrong, the wrong band. I was really in for it then. <laughs> So you want Dave Grohl with you? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. And that, if well, Brian, obviously. Husband and husband. Okay. Yeah. And then one other person. If Brian gets taken out, then it's definitely Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your third? My third? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to stick with Brian and Dave. Okay, good. Okay. I like it. We're going to Brian and Dave. All right. Well, that was fun. And now it's time for our insights recap. I like to think any conversation we have has a lesson in it somehow, and I think it's definitely proven true in our conversation so far, don't you think? Absolutely. Even when we're not really looking for it. Today was really just meant to be a casual conversation with Michelle about how she got into the industry, but there was definitely a theme in there. Or two, even, I think. I know for sure Michelle focused a lot on the fact that in a fast-paced, intense work environment, that more than anything, you have to build trust with the people around you, whether it be your team, your customers, or even like the other crews on a site that you're working with. Yes, so, so important. Um, you know, another thing that really stood out to me as well was the need for asking questions and taking accountability. Uh, you know, Michelle, we focused on the PM side of it, but really I think that this can apply to anyone at Polk Mechanical. I definitely agree. Um, so let's talk about a couple of the ways that anyone can focus on building trust and taking ownership. So Franklin Covey, I'm not sure if that name rings a bell, but he's really well known um, for being a leadership and organizational coach. And one of his books is called The Speed of Trust. I definitely recommend it to anybody. Uh, one of the things that focuses on is the 13 behaviors that demonstrate high trust. And so we can link a document with all of them. Um on the podcast and put it on our online training portal, but I think we should touch on a few that Michelle mentioned. So one of them is to demonstrate respect, and that was definitely something we talked about today, especially working in a male-dominated field. Michelle has found success in demonstrating respect as a way to gain trust from her peers. Um, Another thing she talked about is owning it when something goes wrong, not just owning it, but really coming up with that action plan on how to make it right. And that's another behavior of building trust known as righting wrongs. Yeah, I mean, it happens. We all kind of make mistakes. We're all human. Exactly. 
So that goes hand in hand with another one of the behaviors, which is to practice accountability. And that's not just holding others accountable, but also holding yourself accountable. And when we all practice being accountable, there are less surprises. And now we know that Michelle doesn't like a surprise, <laughs> but who does, you know, at work? Yeah. Um, and another really you know, thing that comes to mind is to get better. So Michelle said the most successful APMs she's had are the ones that are always asking questions. They learn more so they can do more and end up getting better at what they're doing. Yep. I love all that. I think that's a pretty good recap. You know, like we said, we'll post all those 13 behaviors and a link to the book for any of y'all that want to dive a little bit deeper. Awesome. Well, thanks, Courtney. Thank you, Lisa. We'll see y'all next time. Bye.